Hi, um, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. I think we're going to get started. So my name is Rebecca Highwell. I'm an emerging technology reporter. Uh, so this uh, panel is titled Internet from Space, where Leo services fit into the mix. So the reason why we're doing this panel is because we're basically entering a new era of space internet right now. We're increasingly hearing about accessing internet connection from space and particularly from satellites and satellite constellations in low Earth orbit. So, you know, satellite internet itself isn't particularly new. We've been accessing internet via satellite on planes for a really long time. But now we're hearing about it a lot more, particularly because of companies like SpaceX, OneWeb, Amazon getting really, really into this, as well as companies like T-Mobile and Apple also getting involved in satellite connection. At the same time, we're also hearing about governments also getting involved in this too, including Taiwan, the European Union, and China. So we're here to talk about what the case for this technology is, where it, where it stands now, and also just how it works. So uh, maybe before we start, uh, I'd like our panelists to introduce our, themselves, if that, if that sounds all right. So hey everyone, my name is Jonathan Cannon. I'm with the R Street Institute. Um, so I was asked today to join the panel um, to you know, discuss something that I think is one of the most promising and exciting new uh, technological innovations in uh, the broadband industry. I mean, when we think of broadband, we think of traditional fiber optic network and you know, literally having lines of fiber from home to home to connect people to the rest of the world. And this is something that completely changes that paradigm uh, in a really novel and exciting way. And you know, it may not necessarily be the most new, but I think we're finally beyond the proof of concept phase to this really being a meaningful technology that really can transform uh, how we connect and interact with each other. So really excited to have the discussion today. Plus one to those comments. <laughs> uh, I'm Darren Acord with Amazon, uh, Director of Connectivity Public Policy. Um, my team and I support all connectivity policy related to Amazon, how our businesses connect, how our customers connect. Uh, and that also includes supporting Project Kuiper our low earth, low earth orbit, I should say Leo from now on, uh, our low earth orbit satellite constellation. Great. So maybe we can just start with the basics for people who sort of know how satellite internet works. Um, can you explain how sort of these Leo constellations are different from what we've had in the past? What is so exciting or promising about this technology now and sort of start from there? Okay, I'll start us off. Um, I think the big the big difference, first of all, uh, is in the name, low Earth orbit. Uh, the low altitudes that these systems operate at, so for example, Project Kuiper's uh, altitudes are approximately at 600 kilometers, uh, which is much lower to the Earth compared to your traditional geostationary satellite systems um, by thousands of kilometers. And so uh, what that equates to is much higher speeds much lower latency uh, and better reliability uh, because of the lower altitudes, because of multiple satellites into view, uh, not just one satellite or a few satellites uh, operating uh, at a much higher altitude. And so with those low altitudes, with the capabilities in LEO, that also leads to better reliability uh, to, to provide a much better customer experience. Uh, when you think of satellite broadband, I think that that's where you see the differences of a LEO system and the experience that the customers will have. So we're talking about, you know, like hundreds and thousands of satellites as opposed to a handful. Right. Yeah. Um, for us specifically, we'll have uh, approximately 3,200 satellites. And that's a big difference where uh, I think, as you noted in your article uh, explaining some of this, where a GSO system, you'll have one satellite or a small number um, staying in one place, uh, whereas a, a LEO system has multiple satellites um, revolving around the Earth in, in different altitudes, uh, different orbits, uh, in order to ensure better coverage um, and better use of the spectrum resources. Can you explain, maybe Jonathan, if you want to chime in here, like why this would be particularly helpful or why you think this is necessary? Yeah, I mean, so the use case that I always love, and obviously it's a more extreme one, is you take somewhere like the North Slope in Alaska. I mean, this area is covered in permafrost, so it's just geographically impossible just due to the vast distances, um, but also just the ge geography and the topography of the area. You cannot lay fiber in these communities, so these communities are dependent on alternative means of you know connectivity and communication. So Elio really changes the game here because 
you know, they're offering competitive products at competitive broadband prices using this network of low latency, high speed internet without, you know, any optic cable going to the home. Um, you know, right now, a lot of these communities rely on these outdated, like geostationary satellites with these massive dishes in these towns to pay hundreds of dollars for sub broadband speeds. Yeah. And I'll just chime in on that. I think the, the remote location, uh, is a great use case with the number of satellites, uh, you, the, the coverage area that you can reach on the globe, um, and combined with the low altitudes, um, equates to all the benefits I talked about earlier, but in these remote locations, which may not have that level of service now. Um, and also because of the altitude, uh, our satellites compared to a traditional satellite, it's a smaller beam hitting the ground. And so that's a more efficient use of the spectrum um, and can enable more capacity uh, for a system, which is incredibly important in those remote locations that we can reach that are beyond the reach of your traditional wired and wireless networks. So I'm curious if you guys could talk a little bit about the transportation applications, because it seems like a lot of what we're hearing about right now with satellite internet is not, you know, just people like people in their houses, but people traveling in RVs, on cruises, planes, and things like that. Is that something that you're looking at? Can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, So, I mean, the one thing that you hear a lot of um, is, you know, I think it was Starlink that announced that they now have a terminal that you can put on a boat. Uh, So, you know, you can be out in the middle of the ocean uh, on a large vessel um, with, you know, hot, fast, high-speed broadband internet. Um, But even on planes now, you know, we're used to having to pay a crazy amount of money for really slow Wi-Fi that can barely load emails to having, you know, regular broadband internet connection, uh, where some countries have been going so far as to removing the restrictions on taking phone calls on planes. That's for another panel. Uh, (laughs) But, you know, just this rapid real-time communication anywhere on the globe um, in a way that we've just never seen before. Um, It's really quite something. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think you can apply to all use cases, whether it's commercial airlines, uh, maritime customers operating over the ocean uh, is a really good use case where, um, you know, the satellites will be beaming up ocean, so to speak. Uh, And so that's um, plenty of capacity and capabilities over the oceans that airlines can use, that maritime customers can use, um, various use cases uh, in those locations, as well as Uh, connecting, you know, remote vehicles in rural areas. So one of the things I've certainly been curious about, and I think some people are interested in as well, is, you know, there was an effort in the 90s to create like Leo satellite internet constellations, and it sort of petered out and failed. I'm curious what changed? Why is this happening now? What what has happened that sort of makes this possible? First, um, I think the three of us maybe were elementary school or high school in the 90s. So we might not be the, <laughs> the best people to provide the historical perspective. But uh, as I understand it, um, I think you're we're kind of at an inflection point of technologies and meeting up where um, the innovations and capabilities on the satellites, uh, they're much better performing. Uh, it's also cheaper to produce them than in years past. Um, the innovations that we're seeing the customer terminal, the device that a consumer or a business will have at its location. Um, We're seeing much better technology there. Um, For example, we invented a new antenna for the type of spectrum that we use that reduces the size of the terminal so that it'll be cheaper to produce and easier to install. And so we're we're just continuing to see those innovations in the on-premise equipment. Um, And then the cost of getting to space is much cheaper. Uh, We're seeing advancements in that industry um, you know, ULA, SpaceX, et cetera, Ariane's boss in Europe, um, you know, all I think of those things are combining to where it's, um, the technology meeting the capabilities in the sector at, at the right time. Yeah. I mean, I think you touched on all the, the big pieces, but you know, the fact that there is this amazing commercial space race happening. So not only do you have this massive innovation in terms of the, you know, the technology of the satellites themselves, but rockets that can deploy 50 to hundred satellites at a time. Uh, and that, you know, capability and capacity is only increasing. Um, so, you know, we're going to end up with more satellites and we're going to know what to do with it. Yeah. So I'm I'm curious about how you would explain how satellite internet, we should be thinking about it compared to fiber, which is what a lot of people looking at this automatically think of. What are, what, how does this sort of compare to that in terms of benefits and drawbacks in terms of speed and latency and things like that? So, I mean, my, my thing 
at least how I perceive things is as technology evolves and this distinction between, you know, fixed fiber wireless and wireless uh, is becoming so blurred now. Um, you know, in a lot of use cases, fiber still is the best and most efficient way of connecting, you know, in like cities and suburban areas. But again, in these areas where that's not necessarily a practical thing, I don't think one technology should be favored over another. Um, you know, we had panels today and we've heard from uh, the NTIA secretary um, about the innovation and, you know, the massive investment in broadband. Um, but that, they're not sharing that vision of neutrality. They're not sharing that vision of um, applications like LEO that really can transform uh, and have a profound impact on how you know we get connected. We see it as a as a compliment. Um, I think, as as Jonathan said, there there is a place for fiber. Um, there is a place for wireless satellite. Um, if you take a step back, you know everything Amazon does relies on connectivity. Everything our customers do rely on that connectivity. Uh, so whatever way providers can reach the customers, uh, we're we're behind, and so that is why we favor. Um, you know, tech neutrality. Uh, we want as much being provided to consumers as possible. And we think uh, satellite systems, particularly LEO systems, uh, can complement those wired and wireless networks, uh, especially where customers are beyond the reach of those traditional networks. Are there any applications that you think this is really not right for that maybe satellite internet, you know, isn't isn't the best option? I don't I don't want to speculate, but I, I think the urban use cases, I think, um, you know, where cities are wired, where cities have fiber already, I think at the end of the day, you know, the capabilities um, are there to where um, I think satellite can be a complement, a better complement in, in rural and remote locations. Yeah, okay. um, sounds good. I'm curious if you can talk about how many people you anticipate you know, if, if this really does take off and we're still kind of in very early days of this technology, I'm curious how many people you anticipate using this in in the long term. I know Starlink is about a million customers signed up for its service. Um, how many how many people could use satellite Internet if, if everything's successful? Short answer is I don't know. I think we envisioning uh, we envision serving millions of customers uh, around the globe. Uh, I think same for Starlink. Um, if you take a step back, I think it will solving the customers that need connectivity will require more providers, will require more than Starlink, more than Kuiper. Uh, so it's important that we continue implementing policies and FCC rules that support that and, and uh, enable more providers to to come online, so we can reach all of the millions that need connectivity. And I think you know the only thing to add is just as the technology improves. I mean, the way that we can interface with the technology. Um, you know, if you have mobile devices that are able to connect to the satellites directly, um, that's going to be transformative to the number of users that you can have um, and how you know far-reaching that connectivity can be. Yeah, I'm. I think another sort of you know the case that a lot of people make for this technology is that it's going to serve rural areas, underserved areas. What is the plan to make sure it's affordable? to people who live there um, in, in these regions uh, that aren't being served right now or aren't getting, you know, internet speeds that are, are usable for today's, you know, the way we use internet today? For us specifically, I think as, as a starting point, um, low prices is in our DNA uh, and a priority for Kuiper uh, just as part of Amazon. You know, we will, we, our, our goal from day one has always been to launch an affordable service. We haven't announced price specifics yet. You know, we're not operating. Um, but where we have focused on innovating and bringing the cost down is with the customer terminal, the device that a customer, whether it's me and my house, a business, or whoever the customer might be, will have on premises. Uh, one of the challenges with these systems in the past has been the cost, the upfront cost of that device, because uh, it's so high tech. Um, and we have focused on bringing that down. So as I mentioned, uh, we invented a new antenna for this type of terminal. Um, it's a third the size of existing antennas that are out there. Um, and that will equate to smaller size, uh, easier installation. You know, the size equals cheaper to produce at scale. We think those cost savings can be passed on to the, the customer. So for us, that's really where we've been focused on. Uh, we know the need is there, but how do we make it um, where consumers can adopt it. I just have access. And the only thing I'd add is just, I think competition is going to be a huge driver for um, that as well. I mean, there's so many now entrants breaking into the space. 
um, that, you know, that's going to have an impact on costs. I mean, everyone's going to want to be competitive and offer the best product for the best price. Yeah, I'm curious if how many providers you think there's sort of enough room for in this market. Um, obviously, you know, SpaceX, OneWeb, Amazon are getting into this. Do you see an upper limit on how many companies could really be offering this? I, there's room for multiple providers, is our view. I mean, the only thing I'll say is there's only so much room in space. Um, you know, there's got to be room for the satellites. Um, but again, as the technology improves, um, I think that will remedy a lot of that concern. Yeah, so I think a lot of people here are probably interested in some of the regulatory challenges that are raised by this technology. Maybe to start, I'm curious, sort of on your view of how we should go about regulating this kind of technology where, you know, we have different countries have their own regimes for regulating communications technologies, but, you know, space is sort of every <laughs> every country sort of has a claim to space, if it were. And I'm curious how we should be thinking about that. Who should be in charge of, of regulating these technologies when you have, you know, the FCC here, but certainly other agencies elsewhere that might have their own sort of inclinations on what the policy here should be? Yeah, I think the challenge is just, again, this being so new, there really isn't like a clear regulatory paradigm. Um, I mean, the FCC obviously has done a lot with communications technology and, you know, they've kind of positioned themselves to be the person to regulate this new technology. Um, you know, they're standing up a new space bureau and it'd be interesting to see kind of how that evolves and develops. But the, I think they're still trying to figure out what they can do within their existing statutory authority. Um, and obviously Congress is looking at this heavily. They've already had two hearings um, and they're now you know, pursuing different pieces of legislation to really see what they can do uh, to allow this technology to flourish uh, with hopefully a light touch approach. Yeah, I think yeah, it's a big question, uh, both, you know, in the U.S. and abroad. Um, we feel like that inherently satellites operate in with shared spectrum uh, and in space and shared resources. Uh, and so that has to be taken into account in terms of how we're approaching regulations, what rules we're setting in place. Uh, we are hopeful that, you know, regulators can play a role in terms of convening stakeholders um, and working collaboratively to set norms, set standards um, that the industry can operate under. So, you know, we think the FCC has taken great steps on rules in the area of spectrum coordination, critically important for these systems, um, and an area where clarity is needed. Um, and as well with the Space Bureau, the Office of International Affairs that Chairwoman Rosenworcel has set up, um, bringing attention to these issues internationally where the U.S. needs to play a leading role at the ITU, uh, and we ho are hopeful that the U.S. government will continue to prioritize the satellite sector uh, at the ITU and other international forums. Um, we've seen it on Capitol Hill. We see it at the FCC. There's bipartisan interest in the satellite industry. Uh, we want to make sure the U.S. government um, is supporting the sector internationally. Because to your point, uh, you know, with both spectrum and space, it's shared resources. And so we need to make sure that... Um, one, the FCC continues to play a leading role, and then two, globally, I think if we can have norms, rules um, that are scalable um, and the same as much as possible, I think that will benefit uh, systems that have to operate globally and use shared resources. I just want to highlight we will be taking some audience questions in a moment if you're thinking of anything you want to ask the, the panelists. Um, I'm curious if you know about your views on the FCC's new Space Bureau, which is sort of still being set up, but what do you see as the unanswered questions that need to be addressed by the FCC in terms of satellite internet? What are what are the things that do need more clarity, both sort of gestured to that, since this is such a kind of new, new service for a lot of people? Sure. Um, we really, really appreciate the steps that Chairwoman Rose Marshall has taken uh, with the Space Bureau and the Office of International Affairs. Um, again, to repeat myself, uh, I think calling attention to the issues um, at the ITU uh, in the U.S. Uh, and prioritizing the sector, we think is, is very valuable um, and will be helpful for leaders, U.S. leadership in this area. One key area for us where we would like more clarity in the rules, um, to, to Jonathan's point, the, the sector has innovated very quickly um, there are no rules currently for sharing spectrum between newer round, newer licensed systems like Kuiper and previously licensed systems, um, Starlink, OneWeb, and others. Um, there are rules for sharing spectrum when you're licensed together and have the same rights. I don't want to get into the weeds of the FCC licensing system, 
Um, but when you have new systems coming online, newer systems like us, or systems coming after us, uh, there's not clear rules for how you're supposed to coordinate spectrum other than previously licensed systems have priority, which is understandable. They've made investment back decisions, investment back designs. They need their operations protected, absolutely. Uh, but for systems like Kuiper and others that, that come behind us, um, we have to protect them. And uh, that doesn't necessarily lead to incentives and coordination uh, or doesn't necessarily lead to good technical standards in, in how you share the spectrum. So we would just like to see more clarity there. The FCC has started a rulemaking. A comprehensive rulemaking is underway on spectrum sharing rules for LEO and GSO systems. Um, we, we think it's a, a great step in the right direction and want to see that uh, continue moving forward because I think there's a number of issues in there, whether it's sharing spectrum, information sharing that you provide to others, um, what type of information that is, all of those things um, will be valuable to sharing this resource. And, you know, from, from the other side, more of the space sustainability and the space debris issue um, is, you know, as Amazon noted, you know, they're planning a constellation of about 3,000 satellites. Uh, their competitors are planning much larger constellations. Um, and, you know, when we're putting, you know, double, triple, even tenfold the number of bodies in space than we currently have, um, and that's just within the U.S., that's not even talking about what, you know, China or other countries could do. Um, and there's no kind of international policing. There's no one can say, no, China, you can't launch because America already has satellites there. Um, so these are kind of very real issues that, uh, you know, a global stage will need to address and identify. Um, and this is not something, you, you know, the U.S. can handle alone. Like we can have a great sustainable way of deploying, um, you know, competitive constellations in space. But that doesn't mean China is not going to put things up there to try and crash into ours. So, you know, it's something that we're really going to have to deal with head on. And I think that's going to be something that we're going to really uh, have challenges with. But I think we can do it. Yeah, I'm curious about both of your views on the prospects of of effectively regulating the challenge of space debris, which just to fill anyone who's not familiar in is, you know, the you put more and more satellites into orbit. There's also rocket parts flying around up there, really high speeds, incredibly dangerous, not just to other infrastructure in low Earth orbit, but also potentially to astronauts, um, people living aboard um, the International Space Station, other space stations. And it, what is the prospect for solving that problem, especially as the industry continues to put more stuff up there? Um, is, is it responsible to do that, um, given that it seems like we're still figuring out a sort of international solution to, you know, basically the, this environmental challenge in low Earth orbit? I think systems can deploy responsibly. You're absolutely right. Uh, I mean, the two key issues here for operating access to spectrum, access to a safe operating environment in space, uh, it's in everyone's best interest to deploy and operate safely uh, in order to decrease risk of any incident um, or debris. Um, and that has been a priority for Mars, for us uh, since, since day one, just as we designed our system, you know, how we selected our altitudes um, at, at heights that would ensure we could actively and rapidly deorbit if needed, the design of our satellites, having active propulsion on board so we can deorbit them, um, protection of systems such as coverings on fuel sources or, or other vital systems to the, to the satellite where if there was an object, um, you can handle the collision, mitigate any debris. Um, and including just how we operate. I think we will conduct extensive testing on the ground. Uh, as I've heard the head of our business say, there is no repairman in space. So you better make sure that what you're launching works and is fully functioning. And so uh, we are conducting extensive testing on the ground. Once they're launched, we'll test them extensively before we raise them into their orbits um, and then make sure they're working there as well. And as a part of that, we need to share the data and how we do it. Uh, we need to know what we're learning from our system, we need to provide that with other operators. Uh, hopefully they provide that as, as well. Um, we need to be sharing information on how is our system operating, how is their system operating to ensure that we're making best use of, of the resource. Um, the more information sharing we have, we can have, I think, the better to ensure that we're all um, operating in a responsible manner. 
No, I, was just, I mean, the, the only thing I would add is just, you know, it's kind of proof of, uh, you know, everything that's been said, you know, this isn't theoretical anymore. This is a real technology that is, you know, going up in space. And, you know, these companies, you know, ultimately want to have customers, and they want to have a successful product. So it's in everyone's best interest to make sure that, you know, it's working efficiently and working well. Um, and from a global perspective, it's really, it's ensuring that that framework is reflected. Um, you know, and these systems complement each other rather than, you know, kind of working uh, agnostically, uh, antagonistically towards one another. Yeah. So one of the last sort of regulatory questions I want to ask you, or, less, or at least a government question is, I'm curious what you would say to people who are I'm not necessarily critics of this industry, but say it's still very early. Should the government be provide, you know, subsidizing this industry to provide you know, uh, internet access to communities that are underserved. Has this, is there enough proof that this works so that the government should actively be providing funding to it? Um, like I said, Starlink has about a million customers right now. We're still waiting on Amazon to launch its first um, sort of satellites. Is this, is this ready for, you know, the government to step in and actually provide support for it, given that that's a, that's a big part of how we address the digital divide in the United States is just government, government grants. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it goes back to both Aaron and I echoed is, you know, tech neutrality is critical. Um, you know, if we're making the biggest single time investment in broadband, we shouldn't be focusing on any one particular technology. And I think, you know, the use case for this has been proven time and time again. Um, but, you know, I think there's other use cases as well that maybe aren't necessarily as discussed as often, um, you know, in disaster situations, you know, that you can rapidly deploy these networks, um, you know, people lose connection after like a hurricane or something. You can have terminals set up on the ground and almost in real time, people are reconnected back to the internet. Um, but we've never been able to do anything like that before. And I think that kind of application is really going to be transformative. Yeah, I, I agree on the, you know, we're supportive of a technology neutral approach. You know, what makes the, the most sense for the consumer and getting that technology out in the most efficient manager, manager manner possible. Um, you know, we haven't uh, participated in funding, but I, I, it is a fair question. Uh, public resources are being committed toward helping these systems and whatever that technology solution it is. Uh, and so, um, you know, the ability to meet the standards um, and the ability to provide service that are expected under those programs, it's, um, you know, it, it's a good question and I think a, a, a fair priority for the government to have. Great. So I'm about to take a call for questions, but I'll ask you um, one closing question I have is just, what is, you know, the biggest hurdle that you see to this right now that you're sort of hoping to solve in the next few years? And also, what is the milestone that, you know, again, on a similar time frame you're most looking forward to is sort of the next step for um, satellite internet and low Earth orbit constellations? I will speak for Kuiper. Um, the, the most... The Critically important thing for us right now, we would like to see the FCC move forward with its spectrum sharing proceeding. Um, the FCC has taken uh, a number of steps, and I compliment Chairwoman Rosenworcel, all three commissioners. It's been on a bipartisan basis, um, both to provide access to more spectrum for LEO systems, but also to uh, move this rulemaking forward on sharing. Uh, we would like to see that continue. Um, more broadly, we would like to see the U.S. government support the satellite sector at the ITU, at international forums, um, and support it um, along with the other technologies, not favor other technologies over satellite. We think U.S. leadership in this sector is critical. Um, milestone for Kuiper, it's an exciting time here. In the coming months, we will launch our first two satellites. Uh, we've announced our proto-flight missions um, will be launched from Florida on United Launch Alliance rockets. Uh, we will send up two satellites. Uh, we will test our capabilities both on the satellite and in our ground systems. Um, and so uh, that's, an, that's exciting for us. I mean, we started this in 2019, got our FCC license in 2020, uh, and here we are sending two satellites up into space. Um, a big milestone as we get closer to full-scale deployment and connecting customers. Yeah, and I mean, just, you know, this is a real thing. This is happening. So, I mean, I, I see all the things that Darren uh, reflected um, but, you know, U.S. leadership, I think, really is paramount uh, importance here. Um, you know, China doesn't necessarily share the same regard for some of the space sustainability and other issues. And if their satellites crash into American satellites, like, too bad, so sad. So, you know, we really want to push forward and advocate for um, strong international leadership, but also recognizing that this is a realistic option. It's a viable option. It's a strong alternative. 
Um, and, you know, we shouldn't shy away from using it and reflecting it as part of our, you know, with our funding mechanisms with, um, you know, in the most remote areas where we know we're never going to be able to reach them with fiber. I mean, this is a solid way to get people connected. Um, you know, this isn't just this miracle, small use case uh, system. I mean, this is transformative technology uh, that I think has the potential to really change how we interact with one another. So I'm excited to see where it goes. Okay, um, maybe people want to raise their hands with a question. Okay, maybe I'll start with the gentleman in the red shirt and we'll go this way. Uh, the Starlink is seen the demo of the speeds of the U.S. drop by a lot. I bet, and you said this, that as it is with CD, men to see the capacity. What steps are you taking to assure that the hydro does not all as it Yep, Sorry, not aware of, of Starlink's issues, but uh, I think for us, just making sure that we're planning our deployment um, right and accounting for customer use cases as we scale uh, and making sure that things are like satellites, customer terminals, ground infrastructure are all fully operational to make sure that as we add satellites and add capacity that we're meeting that customer demand. What are the white market nets? Yeah, Alex Howard, uh, I'm curious about uh, a, a bigger issue here. And so the U.S. actually signed the U.S. Declaration of Rights. Uh, and there's part of that says access to information is even right. Now that the U.S. government is back in the business of back in human rights again online, um, should we be subsidized internet access in places where it's shut down, whether it's uh, the world's caught shut down or over here at India, taxed to be an ally to do it or those that are not, Russia, Cuba, Venezuela, Iran, and more else. Um, which you all, I uh, rushing for Viber, um, used to shut that battle. Um, which you think that it would make sense for us as a country to be subsidized the services which would not limit access to our allies, for instance, as Starling Pierce to keep in Do you want to start, Darren? Um, it's a big question, but it's certainly a really important question. Yeah, it's a good question. And I think um, an inherently global system, we have to get licenses to operate in countries around the world. Um, you raise a very good question on restricting access to information. Um, I think we are taking that into account as we look at what countries we will operate in um, and making decisions that ensure we offer the best service for our customers while complying with the necessary laws and regulations and not um, operating in areas that may restrict that. How would they stop? It, which should say, if you said we're gonna get full access to open and up to our systems as a discretion of our values, Jeff Meso thinks that the blue light that the Swede at South, the ability to install, would you say refuse to filter out uh, information uh, after a press of the Modi up? It's a good question. Uh, I don't know. We're not operating yet. We don't have a license in India. Um, we're not being asked that. And so uh, I think it's a hypothetical factors that we may face. Okay. Jonathan, do you want, do you have a sort of position on whether the government, the U.S. government should be funding these kind of networks to operate in the more authoritarian regimes that do censor internet access to this via tool? Yeah, I mean, I can't speak to any one technology or what the U.S. policy is as far as building out networks in other countries or, uh, you know, pushing and promoting the right to access to information, I think. You know, we do value that information sharing, and I think it is important that everyone on the planet have access to uh, internet service. Um, but obviously there's geopolitics at play that can sometimes make that difficult or prohibitive. Um, but, you know, I think importantly, you know, the, the value of this technology short term is helping, you know, Americans that, you know, don't have this necessarily uh, restriction and, you know, lack of access uh, will feel like they're getting internet shut down. They just don't even have the ability to connect. Uh, and I think that's something, you know, the U.S. government can more readily address uh, on a short time frame. Are there any other questions? Great. Well, the second, but sure. Uh, you guys book talks a lot about the a law and the building for a three-day ship instead of the GD. He we got a way to Mac one, which then did you prefer to have a regular speed in the hands of Adam T. 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 T.
what's up in the bad seed here's the most helpful or we're being made to those okay. Um, I mean, I, I don't think we should necessarily preclude any one option. Um, I mean, you know, this all relies on comity between different nations. Um, but I think, you know, one country having leadership and pitching something that other countries will abide by, I think is, you know, a critical piece. And I don't think there should be one, you know, limited to one vehicle, but at the same time, you don't want to have overly prescribed regulation that could stifle, um, you know, innovation and roll out of the industry either. I would just add, we want the U.S. to play a leading role. Um, I think the innovation and the leadership you're seeing in this sector uh, is largely by two U.S. companies. Um, and we are, we want collaboration to continue. You know, we've had active conversations. We're part of the dialogue with all the forums you reference, uh, the Paris Peace Forum as well. You know, space sustainability is a big priority there. Uh, so we just want to see that collaboration continue um, so norms can be developed uh, amongst all forums that are involved in the process and uh, make sure that industry, excuse me, the regulatory bodies continue to play that convening role for industry. Okay, I think we'll maybe take two more questions. I know you've had your hand up earlier. Yeah, staying on the international aid for a moment, we've got a country, say a small island developing country that's not being served by fiber office in the really feasible way. What ingredients need to be there for them to get a lot to issue a license and then provide this? Is it more of a spectrum regulation, just a better orbit half covering some parts of the globe and other, what are the feasible I think you touched on a couple of them there. I think a remote island country uh, or state uh, is a great use case for satellite systems, for LEO systems in particular. Um, depending on where it is geographically, excuse me, geographically located, uh, yes, the orbits could play a role. Um, but, you know, you should be able, most of us, or at least for Kuiper, we can cover 95% of the Earth's population. And so, um, Another piece would be, uh, is the infrastructure there on the ground, uh, such as a satellite gateway station, uh, in order to receive, um, in order to connect to the internet, or is there somewhere nearby uh, that you can connect back to the internet? Um, so I think in terms of, yes, you would we would need a license, uh, but also need to look at the infrastructure capabilities. Uh, but the use case you bring up is a really good one um, and really ideal for a system like Starlink or Kuiper. Great. So I, I just want to follow up on that in terms of tying even the existing infrastructure. We all have sophisticated receivers of pocket. So the way you you envision this actually was being direct to the user or a bit of tie in to need the required the vehicle be the wireless as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Our system will be direct to user in terms of the customer terminal at the home, at the business, wherever you're on premises. Uh, we're seeing Obviously, we have, you know, we're hearing and seeing agreements about direct to sell. Uh, the FCC is starting a rulemaking on that. Um, and so I think it's, a, it's another example of the continued innovation in the sector. Um, and we're, you know, looking forward to the rulemaking and seeing how it plays out. Uh, but I think it's, again, just another positive use case example that's becoming possible now. Great. Well, uh, I think that was the last question, but thank you all for coming. This was so interesting. And thank you so much to our uh, panelists. It was great to check in on this technology.